blessings and many troubles. We have a hope that Christ our Savior will hold us fast. Amen. You may be seated. Please join me in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the hope in those words that we just sang. That you came and died for us and that we have a hope that can always hold us. God, we thank you for how trustworthy you are, how you've shown up time and time again in your word and in our lives. And that from the very beginning in Genesis, you created us in your image with purpose. And at the very end in Revelation, you say that you will wipe away every tear and that you will hold us in every moment in between. God, we lift up our missionaries, Dan and Anna Julian, and their children, Calvin and Lucy, and we thank you that they are back in Lancaster, back around a lot of family. And Lord, we just pray as they continue to transition, going back to school, and just with with everything the family dynamics look like being back home again, we just pray that you'd be with them, help them, to be strong as a family, and to continue to, continue to grow uh, together. And Lord, we also lift up Dan as he's going to be going to Belize to train three men to be pastors. We pray that you would get him there and back safely. And Lord, we pray for the ministry that he will be doing in training up three men that will carry your word around that nation. God, in our nation, as we look towards November, as we look towards this election, God, may one thing be true. May the United States, where we live, would it be a place, a nation, whose God is the Lord? That's our prayer. And with that, God, no matter what happens with the results, what the world looks like in a few months, We pray that our nation would have a great awakening to sin. People will be able to see how our actions separate us from God and the problem that that is. And with that great awakening, Lord, we pray there'd be another great awakening of those who would come to know the Savior Jesus Christ and his love and his mercy and they would be made new. Psalm 33, 12 says it. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he chose for his inheritance. And we pray that for our country. And we know that that starts right here in this building. So may all of our hearts know that God is the Lord. And God, we lift up this place And we thank you that you use your word like a double-edged sword to convict us and guide us and shape us. And it is your truth that keeps us steady. And thank you for allowing this to be a church where your truth and your word is preached. And may we never shy away from that. Lastly, God, we just thank you for the ministries here at GCC. Thank you for the men's ministry, the women's ministry, the children, the youth, the young adults. And we thank you for the other groups that meet, such as Grief Share and Mornings for Moms and just so many more opportunities, Lord, that you've blessed us with to connect with people, to connect with our church family, to lift each other up, to celebrate together, and to bear each other's burdens. And we thank you for the ability to do that. We thank you for this church family you've given us. Lord, as we sang in the second song, simply said, here I am to worship. That is why we are here, to worship you and to hear your word. I pray that would be the focus and direction of our hearts in this service, and not only just this service, but as we leave this service, 
and go out into the world. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading today is continuing in the book of Genesis. We'll be in chapter 42, verses 1 to 15. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Then 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain, for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the one who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. He pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, you were spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my Lord, they answered, your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and is no more. Joseph said to them, it is just as I told you, you are spies. And this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Thank you, Tommy. Tommy is our pastoral assistant for youth, and uh, thank you for your prayers, brother and for reading God's word. Just wanna make a quick reminder that at the end of the service, there's gonna be snacks back there in that room. So if during my preaching, I get up and just start moving that way, you know why, okay? It has nothing to do with the fact that I don't love any of you, but there's snacks back in that room. So just wanna keep reiterating, there's food over there. I'm gonna be preaching about a famine, but there's food over there. It's just a little irony here today. Tim Keller once said that God sees us as we are, loves us as we are, and accepts us as we are. But by his grace, say this last sentence with me, he does not leave us as we are. This weekend, we continue our sermon series in the life of Joseph, and in Genesis chapter 42, did you notice what Joseph said to his brothers in verses 14 and 15? Let your eyes catch this. Joseph told them, it is just as I told you, you are spies, and this is how you will be tested. Tested. Tested, the Hebrew word for tested is bahan. It means to examine, to prove, to probe. It is the idea to prove means to reveal through a process a person's true intentions. The word is used over 29 times in the Old Testament, and actually in the book of Genesis, testing is a very prominent theme. The idea that God tests his people is true. In Genesis chapter two, we see testing with Adam and Eve. They are told to eat any tree of the garden except for what? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was a test. They failed. Genesis 22, actually our our children in our classrooms this morning are all studying Genesis 22 where Abraham is tested to offer up his son Isaac as a sacrifice. And now, in Genesis 42, what do we see? God once again tests Joseph, and as we will also see, Joseph in turn tests his brothers and gives them five tests. 
Now, the story of Joseph, captured in Genesis 37 to 50, is truly the story of testing. The last several weeks, we have seen how Joseph was tested in three different places. He was tested in the pit, he was tested in prison, and then he was tested in the palace, in the pit, the pit. As the story begins in Genesis 37, Joseph's brothers throw him in a pit. Literally, it's a cistern. Cisterns were used back then to capture rainwater. There's no water in the cistern, and actually in Genesis 42, there's a famine. A little bit of irony there. Joseph then is taken out of the pit, and he is sold as a slave by his brothers to some Ishmaelites from Gildad, and he is sold for 20 shekels of silver, and while he is being sold, the Ishmaelites then resell Joseph. He's sold twice, and he ends up in the home of a man named Potiphar, but things don't improve for Joseph. They actually get worse, and he ends up thrown into prison where he spends over two years in jail till finally Pharaoh himself rescues and redeems Joseph from prison into the palace. Joseph's journey literally is a transition from the pit to prison to a palace. Now, you might be tempted to think at this moment, hasn't Joseph gone through enough? That poor Joe. You know, I mean, you, you really feel for the guy, don't you? It, the reality is, is that you and I cannot escape the transforming hand of God. He will always push us to make changes in us. And he gets to determine when it's enough. The second thing you might be tempted to think in the life of Joseph is that really this is the story of the American dream. It's a story of rags to riches, overcoming poverty. I mean, look at this poor man, and, and yet look at God's providential hand of prosperity in his life. And if you believe that, you would be wrong. This is not a story of prosperity. It is a story of God. God who redeems, God who rescues, and God who extends his grace to those he is testing. So now in Genesis 42, what do we notice? We notice here that there is a famine that has overtaken the land, driving literally everyone to Egypt where there is grain. And as the providential hand of God would allow, Joseph is there amongst thousands of people begging for grain, and who shows up? His own flesh and blood, his brothers. They're standing right there in front of him. Joseph was tested in the pit. He was tested in prison. And now he will be tested in the palace. How should Joseph respond? How would you respond? You know, it's interesting that here in this scene, the brothers don't realize it's Joseph. Joseph now walks and talks like an Egyptian, but Joseph recognizes them. Outwardly, they look the same, but what is interesting here is that after 13 years, the brothers are now telling a different tale. Did you notice what they said to Joseph? What do they say? They say to him, we are honest men. Yeah, right. And actually, they don't just say it once. They say that phrase three times in chapter 42. We are honest men. We're just humble, honest men. We are now moral, honest men. And Joseph, I don't think, is buying it, and none of you are as well. I mean, how do you know they're honest men? You tried to kill him 13 years ago, but suddenly now you're changed. Right. Is that the truth? Joseph then goes on to say, if that is the truth, then let's test it. Let's run it through the fire. And so in chapter 42 to 44, Joseph gives his brothers five tests. Now, before we jump into these tests, I just want to point out a few things. The first is this, is that during all these tests, none of the brothers know that Joseph is behind them. They don't realize it's him. They don't recognize it. The second thing you need to know is that every test is centered around the youngest brother, Benjamin. Now, I'm gonna say something to you all because this is more about me right now for the next 20 seconds than it is about you. I say Benjamin with an R. I know it doesn't have an R, okay? I don't need emails about how it doesn't have an R. I went to Oxford, you didn't. 
okay? Oxford Public High School, not the university, but you get what I'm saying, okay? I say it with an R. And so just be entertained for the next 30 minutes about me mispronouncing his name. But what you do need to know is that every test is centered upon this young man. Look at verse 15 again. And this is how you will be tested, Joseph says. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your younger brother comes here. The third thing you need to know is this, is that the five tests that Joseph puts his brothers through, there is a load of irony in each one of these tests. And what I mean by that is that every test Joseph puts his brothers through is the exact same thing they put him through. It's irony. And I'm going to do my best to point out the irony. Now, there's a lot of irony. I can't point it all out. But in chapter 42 to 44, if you like irony, you're going to want to go home and study it. Now, let's look at the first test. And you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. It's the test of conscience. In chapter 42, verses 16 to 26, Joseph tells the brothers that one of them may stay behind while the others go back and get Benjamin. To give them time to ponder, though, he puts them in prison. Now, the irony of this is that Joseph was in prison for over two years, right? He puts his brothers in prison for three days, and these guys start squealing. Now, now think about this. I mean, they couldn't last behind bars for more than three days. What sissies? Now, I say that knowing that I've never been to prison, but it just seems a little pathetic. Joseph's there for over two years. These guys are there sweating out for 72 hours, and suddenly they're spilling their guts, and every officer in the room is going, if it was only that easy, Paul, if it was only that easy. Look what they say in verse 21. They say to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. And then the older brother, Reuben, gives some insight. Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy, but you wouldn't listen to me? Anybody in your house say that? You wouldn't listen to me. A little late, Reuben. And, and then the whole thing is, I mean, if, if you were an, an off a detective, like case closed, these guys are going to prison for a long time, right? They don't realize Joseph is listening the entire time. Notice what it says. Now, we must give an accounting for his blood, Reuben says. They did not realize that Joseph couldn't, could understand them since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them, and he began to weep. And then he turned back, and he spoke to them again, and he had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. As hard as it must have been for Joseph to hear those words, and to know their intent, he starts to weep. Why? Because he realizes his brothers have a conscience. They're not hard-hearted murderers. But Joseph has to keep this up because he needs to test whether or not they really are honest men. And honest men don't just get tested for three days. And so he bounds Simeon before their eyes. And now the true test is on. Will they come back for Simeon? Are they gonna leave Simeon like they left Joseph back in Genesis 37? This leads us to the second test. It's the test of money. In Genesis 37, it was clear that the brothers chose money over mercy. They chose money over mercy. Now some 13 years later, Joseph wants to see if this is still true. While the brothers are journeying back to their father, Jacob, in the land of Canaan, they discover that there is grain in their bags and that the grain in the bags is not just grain for their families, but then they discover something beneath the grain, silver. Notice what happens here. Verse 25, Joseph gives orders to fill their bags with grain, to put each man's silver back in his sack, and to give them provisions for their journey. After this was done for them, they loaded their grain on their donkeys and they left. Now, the brothers have no idea this is gone. They show up and everything's done, okay? At the place where they stopped, this is the brothers, for the night, one of them opened his sack to get feed for his donkeys and he saw his silver in the mouth of his sack. My silver has been returned, he said to his brothers. Here it is in my sack. What happens next? Their hearts sank and they turned to each other, trembling, and said, 
what is this that God has done to us? Now, the irony of this is, is that back in Genesis 37, the brothers sold Joseph into slavery for 20 shekels of silver, and now when they find silver in their hands, it no longer brings them the same euphoria it did back in 37. Now what does it say? Their hearts sank. Their hearts sank. This kind of reminds me of the time when I was a poor, innocent child. Some of you, I haven't even told the story. Some of you are already laughing. It's a little loud, Denise. I was there minding my own business, just digging in my grandfather's garden. And my twin brother shows up, and he puts his head where it doesn't belong. You know, some people put their nose where it doesn't belong. He put his head where it didn't belong. And somehow my hatchet struck his head. To this day, I have no idea. No idea. And all I did was casually walk up to my grandfather's house, and I said to my mom, hey, something's going on with Tyler. I have no idea. And she run. you get this, she runs past me, the audacity, and grabs him up and takes him to Jennersville Hospital and then the CHOP the entire time. Some of you are going, I can't believe he's our pastor. I, they hired me. I know, they hired me. And I sat there on the porch of my grandfather's house totally alone. I mean, no one even fed me lunch. It was just sad. But in all honesty, I mean, I, I know what this feels like when you're sitting there and your heart just sinks because you're thinking, what did I do? Now, now, if you're worried about my twin brother, he's fine, okay? He's still alive. He's a little odd, but he's fine, you know? He made it through, all right? This phrase, though, heart sank, this is, this is an interesting phrase. It's only used here in the Old Testament. And scholars believe that this, this means that they were dismayed. They were emotionally drained. Once money brought them joy, and now it sinks their hearts test of the love of money. Leads us to the third test, the test of reputation. Now, when you read Genesis 42 to 44, and you recognize that Joseph wants to see Benjamin, you have to step back and ask yourself, why? Well, there's a rational reason. Scholars actually believe there's three reasons. I'm not going to nerd out and give you all three. I'll just give you one. It's to test their reputation. Joseph wants to meet Benjamin. Why? Because Benjamin is the younger brother. And he knows back in Genesis 37 that he was the younger brother, and they totally mistreated him, threw him in a pit, sold him as a slave. And so Joseph wants to interrogate Benjamin to say, listen, what's the last 13 years been like with these guys? Now, the only problem with this test is it kind of backfires on Joseph. Because when he, sent, when he sends the boys back and says, bring back your younger brother, I'm going to keep Simeon as kind of a ransom until you, you bring it back, you bring him back, what happens is that they go back to their father, Jacob, and Jacob says, no. I mean, this is the part where it's just like, wait, what? Didn't see this one coming. Look what Jacob says in verse 38 of chapter 42. My son will not go. I mean, he really puts his foot down. He will not go down there with you. His brother is dead, and he is the only one left. Now, it's like you want to hit a timeout here and say to Jacob, Jacob, you know you have like 10 other kids, but this is like what you parents do when you have your favorite. This is the favorite, okay? There's, there's no doubt about it. Jacob literally says, this is the only one left in front of his other kids. I mean, that, it's pretty sad. He goes on. If harm comes to him on the journey you are taking, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. Jacob concludes that if Benjamin lives, I will live. If he dies, I die. And you notice that he's willing to make this choice and leave Simeon likely in jail for the rest of his life just so he can cling to one of his sons. And it's not like Jacob wakes up the next morning. You know how like his dad, sometimes we make bad decisions. The next day we wake up, our emotions come down and we come to our senses because our wife, you know, talked to us overnight. Ben, Jacob doesn't do that. The next day he wakes up and he is still like, no, 
And this goes on. If you flip the pages to chapter 43, it apparently goes on for a while because at some point they run out of food. That's how long it went on. But you know how men are. When we get hungry, we start making real decisions. And so he makes a real decision. And, and he is hungry, and he says to the boys, finally, I give up. We're either gonna starve to death, or we gotta, like, someone's gonna not live. So listen, take your brother. He looks at Judah, and he says to Judah, I trust you the most. You take Benjamin down there. Your other brothers can tag behind. You take him down there. Now, here's the interesting part, the ironic part. It's not the fact that Benjamin gets to go. It's what Jacob does outside of any other influence in this story that you gotta pay attention to. Because when Jacob sends Benjamin back down with the brothers to go see Joseph, Jacob calls him the man. He doesn't know it's Joseph either. And so he says, take Benjamin down to the man. And then he says, take a double portion of silver to the man. And then he does one other thing. He says, take the man some gifts. Now, the gifts are really interesting. He says, I want you to take him balm and honey and spices and a Wawa gift card and myrrh and then sp- pistachio nuts. I mean, who wants pistachio nuts at this time of day? And then almonds. I like the chocolate-covered almonds from Costco, but they didn't have that back then. The, my, my point is, the, the gifts were important. Now, they were important because if you were one of the brothers, this would have caused you to tremble even more than finding money in your sack. You want to know why? It's because back in Genesis 37, when Joseph was sold into slavery to a group of Ishmaelites from Gildad, the Ishmaelites were headed to Egypt. And guess what the Ishmaelites were carrying with them? They were carrying with them spices, balm, and myrrh. Look at chapter 37, verse 25. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up, and they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gildad. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Is this not ironic? Think about this. In Genesis 37, there's Ishmaelites headed to Egypt, loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and then they, on, they add on to their list the youngest son of, son of Jacob. Now, in Genesis 43, the brothers are taking spices, balm, and myrrh down to Egypt, and guess who they have with them? The youngest bro- son of Jacob. Now, this is ironic because nobody, Jacob would not have known this. Joseph couldn't have set this up. The reason why this is there is because God alone is reminding the boys, what you did in the dark, I will bring to the light. You thought you got away from it, away with it. But what you didn't realize is I've been watching you the entire time. What you and I do in the dark, and you thought you buried you will one day have to give an accounting for, even to the nitty gritty details. God is watching. That's what he says to the boys. So headed down to Egypt, the boys have faced the test of conscience, the test of money, the test of reputation, and now they will face the last two tests, the test of jealousy, and sacrifice. In the second half of 43, chapter 43, they arrive at Joseph's home and they are welcomed and greeted by Joseph's main servant and immediately the boys hand over the gifts, they hand over Benjamin, they hand over the spices, the balm, and the myrrh and, and the servant looks at the boys and says, you can keep them all. And they're astonished. The servant says, we want you to do one more thing. Would you please come and sit and have dinner with us? And so lined up in birth order, each child of Jacob is given a portion of a meal, except for Benjamin is given five times the amount of every other boy. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible amount. Now, some scholars think that he got five times as much because of the five tests. I think he got five times as much as because Joseph was trying to test whether or not the boys were still jealous in their heart. Do you remember back in Genesis 37? Joseph 
is sold into slavery. Why? Because the brothers were jealous of him, the text says. And now Joseph sits back and he watches each one of his brothers to say, do they still suffer from the sin of jealousy? And here's the interesting thing, not a peep. You read chapter 43, and they all sit there and eat their meal peacefully and quietly. It's what I aspire for my kids to do one day. This happens. Parent, young parents, it will happen one day. It will. You have to cling to hope. The reality, though, is the brothers passed the test of jealousy. But Joseph will not be tricked. And so there's one more test, the test of sacrifice. Joseph sets up a scenario that only he could have done as the governor of Egypt. And this is what he does. It says in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 44, Now Joseph gave these instructions to the steward of his house. Fill each man's sack with as much food as they can carry. Put each man's silver in the mouth of his sack. Then put my cup, the silver one, in the mouth of the youngest one's sack, along with the silver for his grain, and he did as Joseph said. So the brothers get up from the meal and they head out. And what do they have with them? They have the double portion of silver. They have all the gifts. They have Benjamin. They are fleeing and going home. They are celebrating. We have finally been rescued. Our sin has not been revealed. This is awesome. We can go. They get a few miles down the road until suddenly they are surrounded by an army of Egyptian soldiers. Captains get off and they confront the brothers and say, one of you stole from Joseph. The brothers said, no, we didn't. One of you stole. And they start with the oldest and search his sacks. And then they go to Simeon. And then they go down the line until they pass all the way down to Benjamin. And it's in Benjamin's sacks that they find a silver cup. And immediately the text tells us that the brothers tear their garments which in that day and age was a sign of grief and mourning. Shackled in shame, they head back to Joseph. And now Joseph is no longer governor over them. He is now judge. He holds their lives in his hands. And this is what he says in verse 17. In front of his brothers, only the man who was found to have the cup will become my slave. The rest of you go back to your father in peace. At this point, no one speaks. No one says a word. Their face is down on the ground. If you read this story, they are in fear and trembling. No one knows what to say until finally Judah, the fourth born son, stands up and he comes close to Joseph. And this is what he says. I want you to see this. This is what he says. Good. We never liked that kid anyway. Thanks for letting us go. I'm just kidding. That's not in your Bible. Okay. I made that up. Some of you are like, really, that's what he said? After all that, that's what he said? No, he didn't say that. This is actually what he said. I want you to see this. Now then, please let your servant remain here. Who's he talking about? He's talking about himself. Notice what he says. Now then, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave. In place of the boy? And let the boy return with his brothers. Judah passes the test. Not just the test of conscience and the test of money and the test of reputation and the test of jealousy, but it's here that Judah passes the test. He's the only one. He's, only, he's the only brother, the only one willing to lay down his life for another. Does that sound familiar? That one is willing to die for the many? That in this particular scene, we see Judah become like Jesus in the sense that he's willing to sacrifice himself so that others can live. He's willing to live as a slave, literally, for the rest of his life so that Benjamin can go home to his father, Jacob. He's willing to give up, not take. He's willing to lay down and not pick up. He's willing to surrender and sacrifice himself. It's what one scholar said, that it's in Genesis chapter 42 to 44 where we see the hateful become the humble. I love that. It's here that Judah passes the test. 
You see, God sees you as you are, loves you as you are, and accepts you as you are. But by his grace, he will not leave you as you are. And thank God that he changed and transformed Joseph. And by his grace, he wouldn't allow Joseph's brothers to remain who they were. The truth is, he wants to do the same in your life. Do you believe that God can change you? Do you believe that God can transform you? Do you believe that he loves you so much not to leave you the way you are, your guilt, your shame, your past, your ugliness, your sin, that he wants to take that, change that, chisel that, and rewrap that to conform you to look like Jesus Christ? You see, God sees you. He loves you. He accepts you. But he will not leave you the way you are. He wants to do something in you. He wants to change you. Now, I'll be the one to first admit, I'm as southern end as they come. I don't like change. Often. I I tend to like my own way. The problem is you can't stand in front of Joseph and say we're honest men and not be tested in the same way that you can't walk out these doors and say, I'm a Christian and not allow God to change you. Because to be a Christian means that God gets the right to probe you, examine you, and prove whether or not what you say is true. You see, God wants to change us. And when we declare that we are Christians, that means that he has the right. And so here's the question, how do I change? Or better yet, how do I survive the change that God wants in my, in my life? The first is this, to embrace God's grace. Embraces grace. Jerry Bridges says this, your worst days are never so bad that you are beyond the reach of God's grace. And your best days are never so good that you are beyond the need of God's grace. If you are here today and you are under conviction, that you, let me just tell you something, then God is showing you his grace. If you're sitting here today and you're an addict or an alcoholic, let me tell you something, embrace the grace of God. If you're sitting here today and you've had people confront you in the last week that you're a jealous, envious, lazy, proud person, let me tell you something, embrace and cling to the grace of God. If there is a past that you have that you refuse to bring into the light, God will show you grace when you do. He is a gracious God, and it's his grace that he offers to us. And he says, don't just embrace it. Stop resisting it. I've been showing you love for so many years, and you've refused to accept it. The boys have been shown grace for 13 years, and they've been rejecting it, and God has extended it to them time and time and time. You want to know where the grace of God is in this story? It's all over the place, but it started in the very beginning. Did you capture this in, ver- in chapter 42? Sometimes we pass the first verse because we want to get to the good stuff. Look at the first verse of chapter 42. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, that's called grace. There's a famine going on, and you know what happens when there's a famine going on and you don't have food? You die. Now think about this. If God wanted these kids dead, these boys, these men, they're now men, for what they did in the past, he could have starved them out. But the reality is he provides them grain, which is his grace to keep them alive. Why? Not to torture or torment them, but to transform them. And that's what he does in your life and in my life. He continues to keep us alive so that we can be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And so maybe you're in a season of testing. Maybe things are not going well for you. Maybe things are breaking and relationships are ending and life isn't going the way that you had it planned. So what are you gonna do? What do you do when things don't go the way you want? What do you do when your past taunts you? What do you do when what you said you did or what you saw can't escape your mind? What do you do? Do you give up on life? Or do you recognize the grace that God has been showing you every day of every day to what? So that you can wake up to the reality of God working your life so that your heart and mind can be transformed. So that you can realize that God isn't keeping you alive to torture you. He's keeping you alive to change you. 
We said this numerous times in this series that God is for you, he is, he is with you, and he is not against you. God was for Joseph, with Joseph, and he wasn't against Joseph, and he's not against Joseph's brothers. He is for them as well. You know, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, do you know what it says? This is what it says about God. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness. No, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Here's the point. God sees that we are people, not a problem. We are people, not a problem. He created us after his own image, and he has offered us his son, Jesus Christ, so that we could be saved from our sin. And so when we wake up to the grace of God in our life, that he gives us food and air to breathe, and he gives us a mind to use and to think, and we wake up to that, what do we also have to wake up to? The reality of sin in our life. Just because you've recognized the grace of God in your life doesn't mean that you can reject and pass over the sin that so easily entangles us. And so how do we change? Secondly, address your sin. There is sin here in this story that the boys refuse to embrace and accept. And in chapter 42, the very beginning, notice what it says. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Now now think about this. Why are the boys just staring at each other? You want to know why? Because when they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites from Gildad, where were they headed? Egypt. And so every time they hear the name Egypt, what do they think about? What they did 13 years ago. And you can imagine that scene. I'm not going down there. Mm -mm. There is a God. I know there's a God. But I'm not going down there because you know what he's going to do. We're going to run into him. At some point, I'm not going. You going? I'm not going. You going? I'm not going. What's dad going to do? He can go himself. So dad shows up. and You recognize you're not the boss anymore. And he says, get down there. And at some point, you realize, man, we're on our way to Egypt where we just sold our brother as a slave. And what's happening here is that you have to be willing to address the sin of your past and your present. Think about this. When we begin to face God, we are forced to face our sin. There is no such thing as coming to Jesus, declaring you're a Jesus follower, and not having to deal with sin. I find it interesting that these grown men do not want to deal with their problem. They have been living for 13 years haunted by their past. Listen, friends, that's not living. That's just dying slowly. And yet God sees them. God loves them. God accepts them. But he will not overlook their sin. And so he invites them, embrace my grace. Address your sin. And it's not just recognize it. Look, you could sit in this room today and you could say, well, I'm a sinner, Paul. I mean, I listen to country music and it talks about sin all the time. And yep, I'm a sinner and I listen to, I mean, like, come on. It's it's not about just recognizing that we're sinners. It's repenting of our sin. It's it's the idea of what it says in, in, in Psalm 51 when David, convicted of his sin and he's recognized it, what does he say? He says this, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. And so when you've repented of your sin, do you do it because you recognize that God has been kind to you? Are you broken over the sin in your life? Because God is. And he will not let it go. And that's not him doing that because he hates you. It's actually his kindness, Scripture says, that leads you and I to repentance. Paul writes in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, Or do you show contempt? 
Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? He's been kind to them all along. And so he says to these young men, embrace your God's, embrace my grace, address your sin, but thirdly, give up. Give up. Give up. You can't be a Christian unless you're willing to give up. A couple weeks ago, I met with a man in my house, and he said to me, Paul, what's Christianity all about? I said, well, Christianity's about the resurrection, of course. And he said, no, 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 no. What happens after I believe in that? I said, oh, well, that's really easy. You become a loser. And he said, what? I said, well, that's exactly what you become, a loser. He goes, explain that to me. I said, well, you don't understand. Jesus says that if you want to follow him, you have to be willing to lose. That's what he said. You you don't get to be on top of the mountain anymore. You you now get to be at the bottom. You see, you just continue to, to lose things. You give up the things of this world so that eventually you gain life. Jesus said it better than I could in in Matthew chapter 10. Whoever finds his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You want to find your life in money or an affair or greed or, or some job that you've always been pursuing? Jesus says you're going to lose your life. But if you give up, you will find life. And far too long, we've allowed idols into our lives. And Jesus says, you can't serve me and an idol. Matthew chapter 6, do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in to steal. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money, Jesus said. You know what's so interesting about Genesis 42 to 44? Is that literally there is a famine, there's a food shortage, but there is like a plethora of silver. Did you notice that? Like we're running out of food, but we got a lot of silver. (laughs) It's so interesting that at some point the boys decide that we have to give up the silver, give up the goods in order to gain life. And then Judah takes it even further when he says, I'm not even going to give up stuff. I'll give up my life. You can have it. I'll be your slave so that they can live. See, Judah goes to a place where nobody else is really willing to go. And so maybe you're sitting here today and you've got an idol in your life and Jesus has been calling you for weeks now to lay it down and you've been unwilling to do that. Maybe it's the idol of money or maybe it really is an affair or a car or a job. I don't know what it is. But I believe that God has been calling us all along. If you claim that you're a Christian, And you have to be willing to surrender to Christ and let go of the things of this world. How do we change? We embrace God's grace and we stop resisting his grace. We address our sin before one day God addresses us. Thirdly, we give up so that he can rescue us. Tested. It's the Hebrew word bahan. It means to examine. It means to allow God to prove through a process that you are who you've been saying you are. Are you ready? God sees you. He loves you. And he accepts you. But by his grace, he refuses to leave you and I the way that we are. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we say thank you. I don't just say that in jest. I say truly thank you that you're willing to work in our life to bring us to the place of salvation and then at the very same time, you're willing to work to transform us, to conform us, to chisel away us 
so that there's just Jesus. So, Father, we surrender. Do what you have to do. Bend us, break us, bind us. Do what you have to do so that we stop looking like us and we start looking and living like Jesus. Test us. Try us. We declare that we are your followers. We love your son, Jesus Christ. And so if that requires us to be examined, we will. Tested, bring it on. Because we want Jesus at the end of this life. We don't want this life to be it. So Father, thank you that you do not leave us alone, but you are truly with us. So thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Would you stand and worship with us?